Hello and welcome to the College of Lore. My name's Anthony. My name's Josh. And today we'll be your professors. It seems that every time that I start a new game with a new group or search Reddit for an opening, an online D&D game, or even when I pitch a game to some of my friends, the pitch always goes something like this. Okay guys, you're in a fantasy land that something incredible happened many years ago and all of the great tutors and all of the sages and all of the magic users suddenly vanished. So it's kind of like a reset and also there's no magic items and it's going to be kind of like a low magic campaign. And like, as I'm saying this, people's interests are just diving. So Josh, why do you think that is? Have you experienced that? Do you, do you know about low magic campaigns? Is that a thing? Uh, I mean, I may have ran a couple of those. Maybe that's why I'm making this. Yeah, it seems a little, know. I don't know. that Maybe was that. a little pointed. <laughs> I'm sorry I hurt you. Okay, but you know of low magic, and there's a time and a place for low magic campaign, right? Yeah. Well, to be fair, I did give you guys a good amount of low magic items, even like high magic items at some point. But I think that low magic works if you add the correct amount of mystery behind it. But it's also different because you have to balance it as well, because you can't just throw someone into a low magic campaign and have them fight things like normal. So yeah, definitely you've ran low magic campaigns in the past, and I've actually liked them because there is a time and a place for a low magic campaign. Yeah, there's definitely a balance involved. And obviously you have to align your expectations with your players. Uh, you can't have them coming in expecting to be able to do all this crazy stuff when you know, you're running a low magic campaign. So usually talking to them beforehand is something that has to happen. Right. Balance is a key point that I want to talk about because of low magic campaigns. I think a lot of people, including myself, okay, maybe just myself, I, I'm definitely afraid of high magic in D&D. &D. When I run a game for people, they're like, oh, can we, you know, maybe run across this magic item? I think it'd be really cool for my character to have. I'm always hesitant of it because I think it's going to break the game because I don't have a lot of experience like balancing games with high magic items. But yeah, no, in the game that you ran, it was really good. I liked the mystery behind certain high magic items that popped up when everything else in the world was low magic, right? And there's a lot of times when, you know, you, you want to play in a game and someone's like, hey, it's going to be a low magic campaign. That's the first thing they say. And you don't want to kind of like say, I was kind of hoping for maybe like a progression. Maybe we start out super low magic and then it, it goes up higher. Because even the book says that in the DM's hand guide, it says like you start you are a, a local hero and then you rise up to be the hero of a nation. And there's kind of like this progression in the same way that your notoriety goes up and the threat level goes up, so should the magic items. So I think most games do start off low magic, even high magic games. They just, there has to be this scaling progression. And I think a lot of DMs struggle with trying to find the balance to scale up properly. Because if you don't scale up properly, all of a sudden you're in a fight against yourself as a writer to make each next scenario more crazy than the last one to get this idea of scaling. And if you don't do it right, then it's like, geez, it's been 10 episodes or, or 10 weeks have gone by. Or if you meet bi-weekly, then it's like 20 weeks have gone by in real world time. There, there's no real progression. What would you say to someone who's struggling with that balance? What I've found works, because... In all honesty, even sometimes I struggle with this, but when I've found works, there are several ways that you can do the high magic thing or at least cheat the high magic thing. Uh, you can either give players high magic items or things that have limited usage, um, or you can keep track of spells of the party. Like typically uh, certain classes have like power jumps and when they really start scaling hard things like the teleport spell or uh, fly occasions like that like knowing when those things happen is important for you as a dm if you have an encounter that's set up for people that are going to be walking everywhere and then suddenly someone casts fly and screws with your whole encounter because you weren't aware of it then the encounter that's that would be intense is suddenly not intense so knowing the characters of the player and like their capabilities in the future down the road uh, is incredibly important for developing balanced encounters and scaling into high magic scenarios. That's right. That's another fear too of mine is that um, the cool encounter that I set up is going to be just completely demolished by the introduction of magic just at all. That is a utility of the party. They played a wizard because they wanted to cast spells and that's how they wanted to interact with the world. So they should definitely be able to do that. And if you want to increase the difficulty of it, if, if you throw out a couple of encounters 
Like, there should be easy encounters. Not every encounter should be life or death, because that's not going to be super fun, unless that's what everybody signed up for. So you definitely can throw those easy encounters, kind of like uh, stress test your party, and then, okay, well, they, they were easily able to encounter this. Now let's double it next time. Let's double the amount of enemies. Let's uh, double the amount of fights per day. Let's, you know, somehow make it a little bit more challenging. But also, those easy encounters that, you know, your party crushes, that can make them feel awesome. And that can be a reason why they keep coming back to your table. Yeah, for sure. I would agree. There's definitely a balance between what is easy and what's hard. If things are too easy, then they don't feel challenged. If things are too hard, then they just get sad. Right. Um, so you want to make the party feel powerful, but also like just at the cusp of being strained to where they are, they are challenged. You know, challenged enough to where they want to keep going, but not challenged too much to where they want to quit. Right. And that balance is that balance does come with experience, but can be helped with you know. The, the examples that we set so things like knowing the party knowing the players um and even like in non non non-combat encounters like social encounters letting them use their creativity and abilities in those instances also gives the player a chance to use the quote-unquote high-powered situ uh whatever mechanics spells what have you uh in these scenarios and allows them to be creative which can also lend to uh, a more creative like outlet for these high balance things and it's good because you have to worry a little less about balance. And sometimes you can lean on that rule of cool and still not break the game. Right, right. And if you do feel like you're you're writing yourself into a battle of your of your own writing where you're you feel like you're constantly trying to one up things and things are scaling out of control, you can talk to your party and say, like, look guys, I gave you a bunch of magic items, I gave you a bunch of like crazy encounters. Do you guys like this progression? Do you like this rapid leveling that we're doing and this rapid magic items that we're getting? Or should we scale it back a little bit? Because I'm finding it hard to to write these realistic scenarios. You know, I've got like eight dragons, and you guys have uh, ray guns from Doom, and I'm I'm just I'm struggling here. Yeah. So yeah, just just like talk to them, let them let them know that that thing. Also, write a few sessions ahead, and then see like, oh wait, this is scaling up way too high. This needs to there needs to be some buffers between these really cool super duper encounters that that I have prepared. I need maybe some more narrative time. I need some more exploration time. I need something other than these big fights with big magic. Yeah. But even still, like those scenarios where you want them to like think through something or like there's a riddle and a door and the guy just cast disintegrate on the door, <laughs> like that could definitely irk a, a dungeon master. But at the same time, that's part of your party's utility. Like the, if they want to choose to use that level spell to blow through a riddle door, then okay they don't have that going forward and make sure they're not able to rest on the other side of the door and get disintegrate for the next door that pops up yeah for sure i will say that with this though does come a balance of making sure that you don't feel like you need to punish your party for them being strong oh yeah so for sure yeah never never feel like oh because the wizard casted fly and and screwed up the whole encounter that you need to like shut down the, the fly spell for every other encounter there should yeah. be instances where the fly spell is available for usage and instances where it's not. And sometimes it's where it's like medium effective, but it's still a creative way to do things. Don't punish your party for being creative and smart. Figure out ways to challenge them, but don't 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 be like an asshole. Yeah, they, they need to have the choice to use it. But with the maybe the fear in the back of their mind, like, oh, man, I used fly last time to get over this bridge. And then there was another bridge ahead, but not like super railroady like that, where you're like, oh, you use fly. I'm just going to write another bridge right here. What are you going to do about that? Yeah, but like, now there's you're, a magic not... <laughs> wall and you can't fly because there's gravity. <laughs> and there's an anti-magic ray there that above the wall. So as soon as you start flying, it's just going to cancel your spell. Yeah, it's actually <laughs> a really common pitfall that a lot of like newer DMs fall into where they will feel challenged by a player right. and like a player who likes to power game and sh do everything in their power to shut down that player's mechanics to the point where that player is not having fun. Right. So be wary of that. And then you're not having fun. Your players aren't having fun. The other people who are watching this like little fight that you two are having is like, they're not having fun either. It's just so, awkward. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your mom and dad are fighting in the restaurant. It's just weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> too real. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but close to um, home, man. Too close to home. 
Yeah, I think when you're first starting out, come up with an idea for a campaign and you start, you have like your big thing, right? You're like, okay, this is the, the, the core idea that I had, this dream that I had that I'm going to turn into a D&D game. And it's your one thing, right? That's your big thing. And then you cut out high magic because you're afraid of it being trivialized. And you're like, it was so cool when I thought of this idea, I want everyone at my table to share this same like big reveal or this big thing or this like floating city in the sky or this big tree. Like I want everyone to like feel the same way that I feel in this moment right now when I'm thinking of it. So in order to make it seem so impressive, I'm going to cut out everything else around it. I'm going to cut all the grass around this tree to make it seem taller. But that doesn't actually work. You start out with that core idea, you make it cool, and then you add things around it. You add more narrative around it. You add more challenges around it. And if that thing gets destroyed, that one big thing, or if it gets trivialized, then the repercussions from that are really what you need to be working on instead of how cool that big thing was. Instead of shattering your party's ability to destroy your big thing, whether it's a riddle door or the core idea of your entire campaign or, you know, the god of life and light that uh, has vanished from the material plane. Instead of using, taking away your party's ability to affect that, take away or like add on to, instead of taking away, add on the repercussions for what happens when it gets trivialized or when it gets destroyed. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Definitely expand on the surrounding environment behind the thing, the presentation of the thing. Those will help you make that thing amazing and intimidating or exciting or however else you want it to exactly. feel, even without, you know, just deciding that your players won't be able to do anything in the in the face of whatever this thing is. Because D&D is all about player agency as well. So don't get don't let your story get in the way of your players ultimately having fun. You know, there's, there's some give and take there. Right. I'm trying to think of the example. When our party went into uh, that tomb, right and they fell down and there were all these trammels that were holding this uh this god in place it was super scary and mysterious you built that moment up throughout like many many episodes probably since like the beginning right and then i wouldn't say about the beginning but yeah it was it was it was, it was a long time coming for sure and when we finally got there there were a couple of things that uh, made us feel powerless, but they were in line with the story. It wasn't just like, you weren't shutting down our characters at that moment. You were saying like, this god is radiating this like confusion aura at you. And the longer you stay here, the, the worse it's getting on your mind. But you also have like a thousand questions that you want to ask and you need answers to. And this is this might be the only way that you can do it. So that kind of like mystique in there is like, okay, there's a given trade. It's a simple equation. The longer you stay here, the worse it gets. But the longer you stay here, maybe the more answers you get. And our our party got like almost wiped by that that, <laughs> that encounter. Our brains were turned into jello. It was horrible. <laughs> yeah, the the best part about the whole thing is I also didn't limit any of your abilities. Exactly. This was also not a low magic campaign. This was a normal campaign. Right, but in that moment, like there even it was it was set up in a way to where it didn't matter what spell we had. Even if there was a you know a ninth level wizard there, it, he really wouldn't be able to do uh, or a ninth level spellcaster, meaning they can cast ninth level spells. There wouldn't be much that they could do to like protect themselves in in a way, or there there was no real way to trivialize it. It was yeah. written in such a way to where it couldn't be trivialized. And Even if you really had cool. the whole spell companion, you'd still feel weird casting spells and somewhat powerless just because of the the mood. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mean to toot my own horn, but it was a pretty, uh, it, it was, was pretty cool. boss. Cool. Yeah. yeah, it was cool. Yeah. <laughs> so there are some other like really, let's go over some like trivial examples that um, a lot of first time DMs may throw in here and see how we can like spice them up without without getting lost in the balance of high magic and without trivializing every other item that gets come across. So, okay, it's like level one to three. When, when do you throw out the first magic item? So, sometime around there? I don't really have a system. I just kind of send it. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, That's fair. Cause, cause, because in all fairness, the way that I, I... I've been DMing for a while, so I have a fair bit of experience in dealing with like crazy stuff happening. But the way that I typically... I balance the party is I keep anything that's significantly important or cool shrouded in some sort of mystery. There are questions to be had. There's a story behind the thing. If you ever play in my games, you rarely find that I just give you like a plus one dagger that's significant. 
I never just say here is a plus one dagger. It's always you find this thing in this weird place. It looks strange. It it, it says stuff. Yeah, you, know, you, there, do, you don't there's some, come out and yeah, say there's some significance, and you have you have to invest yourself in this thing to find out what it does. Very true. Yeah. Um, and then it's not like every other treasure trove they come across has to have a magic item after that because you're scaling up. What makes it cool is okay, this one was the one here. Uh, that I found that was really a cool magic item. In uh, Curse of Strahd, there's the one that like, you get like a literal lightsaber. It's a saber and it casts light. Uh, so it's cool against vampires. But um, yeah, you basically oh, like, cool. find a lightsaber in this semi-low magic. Um, it's, it, it's weird because all the high magic items are in Strahd's castle, which means they're hard to go get and they're hard to find. Or they're shrouded in mystery. Like you have to read through the tarot cards and predict the future and find out where certain things are um so the game has like really good replay value mm. and like you said shrouding those items in mystery making them one-offs um but not every other treasure trove doesn't scale up from that it's kind of like little blips on the radar and then what you exactly. said about balancing your party it's like okay the fighter's having a tough time maybe there's a magic sword in the next treasure trove Ah, the wizard's having, uh, it keeps getting hit. Maybe there's like some wizard robes that are uh, plus one armor, or there's a, a ring that he puts on and once per day he can go invisible. Yeah. And if you listen to your party, oftentimes they, you don't even have to think about that. They will bring it up to themselves yeah. and their party. They're like, ah, like they will talk to their party about the money they've accrued. They're like, I'm shopping and I'm looking for things that'll help me with my armor. Uh, and exactly. you know it might not be around at the time but you can throw it in somewhere down the line and they'll be like "Ooh, you know yeah yeah they're, they're saving up for um full plate mail and then all of a sudden they find like some legit magic plate mail yeah or you fight something with giant legit plate mail and then you're like sweet yeah, and it can... feels like you earned it so it's like it's exactly, better than just because yeah. let's be real in my opinion shopping is boring <laughs> i would rather fight things and steal their loot and then wear that stuff as like a memento to my glory and power than just go to a shop and be like hey i want to buy everything and then buying it it's not the same oh you want a plus one fire breathing armor sure we've got that in the back and just fits you wow yeah wow <laughs> it's been specially tailored for your size and strength <laughs> yeah that's that yeah okay <laughs> i see that for sure um there's yeah. other things you could spend money on yeah what i've found is players enjoy items with a significance and it's a great way to not only keep them invested but also power balance the team because if they're invested in a cool item it honestly doesn't matter how strong the item is oh true yeah yeah it could just be like a plus one sword or whatever just a plus one sword and um Back in my day in second edition, we didn't have no plus one sword. You had to fight. Anyway, <laughs> um, it could be a plus one sword, but, you know, if it's uh, John the plus one sword that talks like King Arthur, then it's like, holy moly. And this it's is cool, cool as shit. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. Yes, sir. <laughs> Remember, uh, in the game that we played, I believe I gave your character a samurai sword or a katana. Yes. And you were not proficient in katanas. No. <laughs> not till the but very, God, very and end. And that katana, <laughs> that katana was also a gift that was technically stat wise way beyond your level, but it never broke the game because one, you're not proficient in katanas, and two, it was basically almost one hundred percent thematic. So it it never broke the game, but it was still useful in a spot, which was cool. Right. Yeah, that was my mom's katana that I had to find and uh she had two of them and one was missing and like it was a complete set you had to get both of them and oh man it was so good because it just linked in with the story way more than it linked in with like a mechanic i'm i'm a pretty pretty power gamer when it comes to it because i like my characters to feel big and strong so i i try to you know min max the system as well as i can just to see how far i can push it because to me that's fun and at the same time it's like that story just overwhelmed that desire in me and you know whatever it was just made it so much cooler yeah the chance for glory will overwhelm numbers in my opinion almost every time because you're not proficient but if it did work but it's it so did, cool yeah and it did work sometimes and you just and it felt was like so a cool. badass yeah and that was exactly. enough if it worked every time it wouldn't feel that cool exactly exactly 
I'm sure we can um, maybe in the comments of of this on the on the website we can maybe go into some of those details like more we can post the the stat page for it and and sh ex kind of explain in the comments a little bit more about how it was created in such a way to where uh, it didn't work all the time or or some other items that don't work all the time that have like limited uses pretty much is is a good way to balance it. Another sure. thing that like people talk about is uh, this trope for first time dms is like you enter a room where no magic can be cast it's like all right okay all our magic items that we worked so hard to fight for now are useless okay let's go through this room and those are cool on occasion to like see how good the party's tactics are if it's a fight or see how quick they think if it's a skill challenge you know how do you how do you do a do that correctly i mean i think it's just a, a game of resources like all RPGs are just resource-based games. Spells are resources, hit points are resources, and some games sanity is a resource. Spell slots and time, if you... Um, so many times in the games that you had us run, we could have spent four weeks going somewhere to do something, but within four weeks, something was going to happen. So we needed to be at that point when four weeks were up. Yeah, I, I would agree. I'm also not against... The fact that there are rooms where let's say no magic can be cast i think sometimes it's a bit gimmicky but like the previous i think it's all about presentation and logistics if you're entering into a castle that is well renowned for having strict magical security well before you get into that thing people won't feel gimmicked into not being able to cast or being limited because they have time to prepare for this scenario so it still feels earned if you throw someone in to something where they don't understand what's going on and suddenly they just get zapped for casting a normal spell yeah then they kind of feel robbed because like you said that time and spell slots and hp are resources the the environment of that situation is like level design in that essence the the the, the limitations that you set on a character like no magic is the same as putting them in a sense in like a volcano where there are platforms and they have to jump from platform to platform in in a sense but it's just different if they are aware that it's going to happen and they can prepare for it or if they get warning, or if there is a good reason for it, then players are way more willing to be okay with that scenario than if it's just a way to punish them and to shoehorn them into whatever it is. Obviously, this is like a balance because if a player that relies on, let's say, melee all the time, like if you have a monk and they go through like three sessions where they can't punch anything without oh, dying, no. that's kind of screwed up. But if there is a scenario where you're like, okay, you know, we're going into uh, an ooze cave or whatever. Yeah. And the monk knows well beforehand that this is going to suck. He might be able to go off and buy some gloves or he might be able to, you know, maybe not even fight with them. Go scout the area or do something else that's useful as a monk that won't feel make him feel powerless because he can think about the other options that he has. Now, if it's just like you fell into a cave, there are oozes everywhere and you have to do this for the next three sessions. It's kind yeah. of it's, it's stupid. You know what I mean? So obviously it's presentation and, and logistics. You got it. There's a balance between uh, that because because I've done rooms where there's no magic and it's been fine. It just depends on how it's presented. Yeah, it's not like this whole dungeon is no magic. Like there's a difference between that in terms of balance. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, can you imagine a whole dungeon where you can't cast a single spell? Brutal. That would be awful. Yeah, that would be awful. Yeah. <laughs> I would not have fun. Everyone is a barbarian, but some of you have nine strength. <laughs> also, for some reason, the, the room makes it so you can't rage. There's, like, soft music playing on the speaker system in the game. <laughs> Your movement speed has been reduced to five. <laughs> Here's a dragon to oh, fight. There's, like, games where you can't run. It's, like, shift doesn't make you run in those games. It's just, like, oh. ugh, hate that. It's like that awkward spot where you're following an NPC, and if you run, you're faster than them, but if you walk, you're slower than them. <laughs> Mind-numbing. Oh, yeah, my God. the worst. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to sum, sum up the, the no magic room and, and um, the balance of the, the magic sword is uh, the reason why it's done is for tension, and there's other ways that you can, you can implement tension by instead of reducing a, a character's agency that they specifically spec'd into, you know, just make something more challenging and add more encounters. There's different ways to sap your player's resources if you want to experience a rising tension. I agree. There was a, uh, there was a, another podcast. I forget what it was. It was a long time ago that I, I listened to, or maybe it was an article where or maybe it was something basically, I said. 
because I'm it, so it wasn't something. It, it definitely wasn't something that you said. But, you okay. know, we can pretend that Tony, <laughs> my fellow wise and amazing scholar, said this, where it was an entire encounter leading up to the f fight of uh, a dragon or something, something epic, something crazy. And the presentation of that dragon was so intense that the players chose to like not encounter this thing. They had their agency. They chose to not fight this thing. This thing had like 15 health though. And they were like level like nine. So if you, if you can expend, there, there are lots of resources in this game and it's just on how you choose to manipulate these things uh, to, to make your players feel a certain way. And if they feel a certain way, then it's okay. It doesn't act like the numbers really don't matter that much in my opinion, but maybe that's, the role player in me and not the the dm in me yeah and that takes practice to um to present something in such a way to to uh make the characters choose something different just by the power of your words i mean if you can do that then you have an honorary degree in the in bardology from the college of lore so congrats yeah, to we'll you get, yeah, we'll give you that. a degree we'll give you a, p a piece of paper it yeah it says you're you get a degree that's how i got my chiropractic license yeah, I'm exceptional in MS Paint, so <laughs> we'll draw that right up for you. Uh, very cool. Very cool. You can always ask your players not to trivialize your big thing if you have a big thing. If you have that fear it's going to be trivialized, ask someone else who's a dungeon master. Hey, I've got this thing. I don't want it to be trivialized. How can I go about it? You know, you give them some specific examples. I'm sure they'll say a lot of the same things. You know, bolster the presentation a little bit more and kind of lead up to it, build up to it in such a way to even if it does only have 15 health and it's dead in three rounds it's still an uh, an epic fight that people are going to talk about because of the the build up to it yeah and if you're struggling with that sort of stuff and you don't really have anyone else to talk to about it you can always watch other more experienced dms online and like youtube and stuff and see how they handle big story encounters like big boss encounters because that's what i did uh, while i was learning and mm. i'm still learning and i watch always. them when i'm having trouble learning. Another reason why people yeah. want to do with high magic is for that gritty realism so that you can, you know, spec out the weight of everyone's pack and make sure they're all eating three meals and drinking, you know, eight cups of water a day and uh, just get that gritty realism of survival. And if you talk to your players beforehand, like we've said a million times, you can do that if they're on board with that for sure. Or if you say like, there's a really cool magic item out in the desert. Do you guys want to go get it? I'm going to be tracking this stuff for this particular part of our game you know not the entire game but just this particular part i'm going to be really strict about tracking food and water and um okay then you have high magic and the player cast create food and water and you know that's it you know your your gritty realism is gone it's thrown to the wind and what do you what what would you do in that situation josh if you have a uh, a, a good number of players of a high level and they know how to create food and water. How do you send them out into the desert and make it fun and challenging? Well, you have to think about it in, you sort of have to think about it outside of the box in that sense, because obviously the thing with gritty realism is it's centered around the theme of uh, actual medieval life with no magic, right? That is low magic is basically that, but also like it's make believe. Um, if you have a high magic campaign with high level people and you want them to experience uh, the hardships of like normal people life it's incredibly hard so you sort of have to give them supernatural events that are like amplified versions of those things uh, if you want them to experience greedily realism uh, a, a wizard who's level who's high level is is never going to care about anything that like normal mortal people face <laughs> exactly. you know, water food uh bed like they'll conjure up all that stuff so yeah heat exhaustion that doesn't occur those aren't problems it's actually exceptionally hard to do something like that for a high level person. Honestly, the best way to probably go about something like that would be off the top of my head would be encounters uh, exactly. or yeah, encounters or like the, the land itself is in somewhat a destitute, like cursed state. Here's how I would do it. I would have a, like along the way, I would have something that they could explore when they go into this mini dungeon in the desert to explore they expend a lot of spell slots then they have to choose okay am i going to defeat this one encounter very easily or am i going to have my magnificent mansion to sleep in at night you know it's, it's one or the other am i going to cast disintegrate or am i going to be 
I don't know if the spells are the same level. I probably should have thought about that a little bit more before I made that comparison. But am I going to dis- disintegrate this thing, or am I going to sleep in a nice house tonight? Like, that's the choice they have to make. That's the resource they want to expend. And then if they do so, okay, they beat the encounter. Well done. Now you guys are sleeping in the desert, and it's going to go from 90 degrees Fahrenheit to, like, negative 20 tonight. So what are you guys doing? And yeah. then, then it's your gritty realism. You've got it back. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with that in a sense. Uh, it's sort of like handling, a, in a way, when it comes to that stuff, like traveling and like dealing with the terrain of the land, it would be on the sense of like a like a West Marsh campaign, you know, where you're going from tile to tile exploring places. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically for this desert situation, I would agree. Um, and also there's that sense of danger of like more encounters that you don't know what you're getting into. Again, it comes down to like mystery and like you don't, you're not really sure what you're facing, right? It might get really cold. It might get really hot. The, the sand might be full of monsters and you have to keep fighting things. You don't know what else to fight. You don't know how far away this place is that you're going to. You don't, you don't even know where it is. Uh, and that you can use to sort of play to your advantage. There's a bunch of tiny scorpions in the place where you decided to make camp for the night. <laughs> exactly. The element of surprise is inc- is exceptionally strong uh, in D and D when it comes to DM for when it comes to DMing for players who are incredibly high level. Now I'm just thinking of like skeleton mummies that are buried in the sands of the desert. <laughs> Ugh, man, I uh, gotta watch the mummy it, again. It's a terrible movie. Is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've never so seen it. Bad. I think I've seen it in like it's summer not... camp when I was like in third grade or something. It's. It's not a good movie, man. Uh, the All Mummy, right. the Mummy One is okay, but like when Dwayne the Rock Johnson comes out and he's a scorpion, like the. I think that CGI holds up. It's, <laughs> it's just it's questionable to say the least. Anyway, I, the thing is, is like I I also don't feel like that kind of falls under gritty realism though. Like monsters and scorpions and and sand dudes, those that's not really gritty realism. That's just like encounters. If you want to make a land dangerous, it's not hard. You can just add stuff to it, you know what I mean? But gritty realism, uh, D&D is actually not really set up for that, which is why modified things are in, put in place, like low magic and such. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, there are other systems for that, but we're talking about D&D, so. That's true. No, I mean, I think we should talk about other systems. I think there's a, an entire world out there of stuff we haven't explored on this podcast. Yeah, two things. So we definitely should talk about other systems that are better suited for gritty realism or better suited for horror or better suited for space. Because, I mean, you you could do anything in D&D, but you could do anything in GURPS. And then there are systems that are specifically tailored for these things. Like, if you want to play a horror game, there's Call of Cthulhu. If you want to play a horror game and, like, beat the monsters, there's Delta Green. And then, like, this is definitely a good idea to talk about on a next episode sure to subscribe guys for future episodes instead of like regularly scheduling the podcast and talking about something random each time we're going to be talking about things that we specifically want to talk about how do you pick up girls in dnd i'm sure there's specific uh scenarios <laughs> out there for that but not D. <laughs> there's, there's like a, a things that we want to talk about romance simulator oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, geez uh, no, um, I mean, did you know that uh, our podcast is one year old today? Our baby podcast. There's a train passing by outside right now. It's going to be super fun to edit this. I don't even hear it. Yeah, so um, next episode we'll be talking about uh, some of those other systems that are better. We're just going to go through really quick and simple a bunch of different scenarios and a bunch of different games that might be suited for them. And then if that's interesting, we'll talk in depth about each one and why it's cool or why we've played it before. Or why we should play it a game that maybe a scenario we've we've never played before. Uh, we'll we'll talk about something like that. Um, that sounds fun. You guys should it? follow to make sure for more content. <laughs> yes, yeah. I think though, if right now if you're hearing about this podcast from someone else, that's probably the best way that uh, it'll be spread around. So, if your friends play D and D, share this podcast with them. Tell all of them. All of them. Post it on Reddit and Twitter and your YouTube channels, and your local discords, and your not local discords, Speaking everywhere, of really. YouTube, I've been putting out some YouTube videos, like in-depth analysis of things on Critical Role, in-depth analysis on dungeons. Um, those videos are really fun for me to make, but I really have to be super interested in them. So if, if people get in the comments and say, I want a super long video about this, or I want a super long video about that, give me some in-depth analysis on this game system, 
I will do it for sure. I just, I need to know what you guys want to hear and I'll, that'll psych me up and I'll, I'll create another 20 minute video deep dive. Sounds good to me. Thanks very much for listening and I hope you guys have a great day and a great new year for our podcast. I'm super excited. Insert bell noise here. That's the bell. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.